Hello, um, this is the last part of the trigonometry. It's quite short, um, so it won't be all that difficult. The other thing is, um, I'd like to kind of, as we're going through this, to introduce you to the fact that you're actually able to play around with these equations yourself, and in particular to play around with the, the drawings that actually generate most of these equations. So what we're going to start with is the sine rule. Now, the general methods that are used um, for the proof of the sine rule that you will see in the textbooks have to do with the basic triangle like this. I'll pick a triangle and they'll say, find the perpendicular height and you'll be playing around with some angle like an A. And using this they'll come along and um, come up with the sine rule. There's a much nicer way than doing this. And one of the things that's always concerned me about the sine rule is it doesn't really tell you how it relates back to the circle. And after all, the circle really is the thing that spawned trig in trigonometry. So why don't we get rid of this and change how we look at things? Just um, to start with, something that we've looked at before, I'll just do it again. If we have a right angle triangle, and we'll say that the hypotenuse of it, we'll call it R. Obviously, we're calling it R because anytime you have a right angle triangle like this, you can always imagine that there is, that it is some static part of a circle problem. So a big, big circle runs around. And we're saying, we're looking at this particular case. And I will just say for the moment that this is angle A. And we want to find out the length of that side. The ways that I normally do this is I imagine that we step out one unit on the hypotenuse or on the radius, just one unit. And then drop a line. What we've basically done there is we've set up the right angle triangle in the unit circle. So let's draw in our unit circle for the moment. And that little inside circle is the one from which uh, we developed our trigonometric functions in the last one of these talks. And we're saying, aha, I now know that this side here is sine of A. I also know that that length is cos of A. Again, by the same argument we used in the last talk, we have two similar triangles here. The, the side for which I know uh, information in each of the triangles, the, the similar side, is the hypotenuse. The ratio is 1 is to R. And in that case, where I've got cos of A, the other has to be R times bigger than it. And where I've got sine A, the other has to be R sine A. So we can immediately write down that this is R sine A, and that that length is R cos A. OK. So then, any time we see a right angle triangle, and we'll just draw another one just for the sheer fun of it. Whatever you want to call it, let's call that L, and we'll say that's theta. I can immediately state that this is L sine theta, and that this length is L cos theta. Okay, basic little principle. It makes um, the working out of those two and three dimensional trigonometric double and triple triangle uh, problems much easier when you just see it like this. So instinctively, once you find that the radius, uh, you, you know the radius length or the hypotenuse length, you can automatically write down the two sides. So OK, background. That's just background. Let's now have a look at something that you saw and had on your course for junior cert.
I have a triangle here. This guy. Now any triangle, no matter what it is, the three points of the triangle will fall on some circle. In this case, we've drawn in the, what the circle is. Well, it's meant to look like a circle. And we'll say, for this particular circle, there's a radius r. Now, you will have seen before, for your junior cert, this shape. And what you would know from it, from that basic shape that you had for your junior cert, was that if I had an angle here, we'll call that angle A, and I'm calling it A for good reason, okay? We knew that this angle at the center was 2A, so I can draw it this way. Say there's an A here, which means there's an A here also. Now then, for the sine rule, across from the angle A, we've got side A. So this overall length here, is A. That's side A. And say, so what is that? Well, I've got a right, two right angle triangles here. This height here, I know it. And I also know that height. Here's my little triangle. Hypotenuse is R. The angle is A. So here, I can say it's R sine A. And the same thing down here. So what I can now say is that the side A is equal to 2 by R sine A. So And likewise. So we're saying A over sine A is 2R. It's twice the radius of the circle that is formed, or sorry, that the three points of the triangle sit on. In other words, a over sine A is the diameter of that circle. Because this is a constant, then it's true for the other sides up here. We could have been looking at that one up here, that angle. And we could have been looking at that one. This could have been the C angle and that could have been the B angle. So we have our ABC triangle. But what we've done is we've also added in the center of the circle and the radius of the circle that contains the three points of the triangle. So, because this thing here is a constant, it's true for each of the other sides. I much prefer this uh, way of looking at it. I'm not asking you to use it uh, in the exam or anything. I'm just letting you see that the sine rule, very interestingly, gives us a situation where we can peer back to the circle and we can tie in circular geometry to trigonometry. Um, a curious thing that comes out of this, just before we move on to the rest of the chapter, if I produce if I produce a circle with this time, instead of being the unit circle we've known from before, this time Instead of going all the way, sorry, to one, it's a half. So it will have a radius of a half. 
what we can now say, based on what we can see from up here, if that is a this length here, is sine a. And if that's b, this is sine b. And with this being c, that's sine c. Curious. Now, it may not mean anything to you guys, but I like this. Um, all of these things become much clearer to you when you can actually relate back to the basics. And the basics really uh, for the trigonometric functions uh, lie in the circle. That's the sine rule, um, explained more than perhaps you would normally hear it explained. The cosine rule, <coughs> the proof of it, is very straightforward, okay? Now, I don't particularly mind um, what method you use for proving the cosine rule, because it isn't a big, uh, it isn't a big issue. Um, it's it's straightforward. Now, I've spent the time on the sine rule because I feel that understanding these basics is what should bring some clarity to um, trigonometry, or at least bring it to life for you and get to see just how it relates to thing to things. Now, just before I move on from this, that basic graph or drawing that we drew there, which I'll try and redraw again here. Now, that, believe it or not, can actually help you prove um, almost all of the identities that we looked at in the last talk. Um, you'd be surprised what can come out of this particular drawing. It's a great opportunity to play around the place. Um, the identities, many of the ones that you've been looking at, believe it or not, pop out of this. It's the kind of thing that I'd be very happy to leave to you guys as an exercise rather than spending maybe two hours going through 20 or 30 of things that I would have spotted over the years in relation to this. It's a great opportunity. If you start to play with this and if you want to, for argument's sake, work out what is that length here. You can work it out quite easy, of course. Because, just for argument's sake, we know because we're dealing with the unit circle that this side here is sine a. I know that this length is cos a and I know that this length back here is 1. So then we could easily find if that was L you can say that L squared that length there is equal to 1 plus cos a squared plus Now you can ask yourself if there's any other way that you can define L in relation to your um, graph that you have here. And the last thing that makes life very interesting on this particular one is when you bisect L in two to produce these little triangles. Virtually everything that I've seen in trigonometry I can develop from that particular graph. So if you want to play around and get, uh, I suppose, experience in manipulating geometry um, and the equations and seeing what it actually relates to, you could do a lot worse than playing with this particular drawing. There's a set of equations 
which are the sums and differences equations. And for example, we can write Now clearly it's very easy to get to this. These are the easiest of them all to actually prove because all we really have to do is expand this out and expand this out and you're going to be left with that. So there isn't, there isn't a difficulty in this. The kind of questions that you now get when you get into these sums and differences um, equations will relate to multiple angles. You could finish up with, with a 3 theta and a theta or even a 5 theta and a, let's say 2 theta, that kind of stuff. So when you get angles which are multiples, uh, which are a multiple of other angles and preferably more than just two because then you're into um, the, um, the half angle and double angle formulas we were talking about. But once you get those, you expect to be using these type of equations. So let's have a look at the kind of simple stuff that comes out of this. We're asked to prove this identity. What you will notice is that we have an A, we have three A's and we have five A's. So this is absolutely, perfectly um, the type of problem that we are going to be applying these um, equations to. The one thing to watch for uh, is that many of the expressions like this top line here, you will have something is going to be equal to some trigonometric function of the angles added and a trigonometric function with the angles take, one taken away from the other. This is the one, this last one is the one I want to bring your attention to. When we have a cos of an A minus a B, we should be ensuring that the thing we're going to call A is going to be the big one. Okay? You'll notice the ways this um, equation is written down here, that probably on purpose the 3A is written in before the 5A. It's always worth your while to rearrange the equation simply to um, ensure that you're calling the A the big angle and the B is the smaller angle. Now, of course, you don't have to do it. It just means that at some later stage, you'll finish up over here and you'll have cos of a minus angle in here. And you will have the extra little step of thinking okay, cos of a minus angle, how does it relate to the angle? Or you may have a sine of a mi minus angle and you'd say, how does that relate? So just to save yourself the bother, what you do is you immediately ensure that your A is going to be the larger angle than the other, and you do that by reorganizing. Now, the, the top one wasn't difficult, but with a minus down underneath, if I pull out, if I swap these around, I'll have to pull out a minus, okay? So I'm going to get minus outside of that's just putting the big angle first. I know it's writing an extra line, but it actually clarifies the situation and it makes it easier for you to proceed on this. So we will say that's equal to twice 5 and 3 is 8a. Eh? 
No. Get that. There you go. And just so you're clear, these little twos are cancelling happily away again. Easy. Familiarity is the important thing here. If you are looking at the, this second trigonometry chapter and if you have not gone to the bother of practicing enough, all you're looking at is a mind-boggling number of different types of equations and where do I use them? And you will have three pages of your logbook open and you'll be flicking back and over between them and you'll be trying to say, which one should I use here? That is a nightmare. To avoid that, practice the exercises that are in the book. Because once you do that, you now turn something that's not really familiar into something familiar. And then life is very easy and it is a very uh, handy chapter to deal with. Now there isn't a lot more left on these things. We just want to get back to something we discussed before. If we say something very simple such as very simple equations, cos theta equals zero. You might say, not a problem, okay? Um, they can be very nice to you and they can tell you, oh, theta should be between zero and, um, and 360. Now, be careful about one thing, because sometimes they'll say to you, zero degrees less than or equal to theta, less than or equal to 360. The important thing to be watching for are the equal to's. We know if there was two equals to there, we know that both 0 and 360, the costs of them are 0. So in many cases, what they will do, they'll give you that kind of a limit. Why are they doing that? Because they don't want, you, want to have you look at all of the times that you run around in a circle for these things. The first chapter in trigonometry had a lot in relation to reference angles that if I'm dealing with that angle I can find the reference angle that belongs to it okay now let's look at so uh, one that is a little more complicated than that we will look at sine theta equal to minus a half. The secret to these questions is draw your drawing. Sine theta equal to minus a half. Okay, how can that be? Find the reference angles. In this case, you will notice that it isn't one, but there are actually two of them. Is that true? That's the cos one. Just remember A, C, T, S. Going in this direction, this sign A, C, T, S acts. Okay, so what we'll notice is yes, sign is negative down here. Where's the other one, other place that it's negative? It's negative over here. So this one and this one both give you a negative sign. So we're going to be looking now for that reference and that reference. Okay? If I had got cos of theta equal to minus a half, I'd be looking at that one and that one. But for the sign, we're looking at this one and this one. The signs are negative down here, the cos is negative over here. So okay, for the sine of theta equal to minus a half, we'll find the reference angle, we'll say sine of r is equal to 
I have. You just look at the positive one. Okay. So that implies r equals 30. So we know that we can be down 30 here, or 30 here. So we actually have two solutions. So there are the two answers to that particular thing. Draw your drawing. When they're talking about a minus, you're saying the signs are going to be minus in these quadrant 3 and 4. So you draw in both of them. Having done that then, it's an easy job. These type of prob problems advance on to this kind of a problem. And we go to our drawing. We know cosses are negative over here. So we're looking for something in that quadrant and in that quadrant. Okay. What's really important now is if they've told us, okay, naught is less than or equal to theta, which is less than or equal to 360, that's fine. We're only going to look at it for one for less than one complete revolution of the circle. But they could look for a lot more than that, okay? It could be that you're asked to produce a general case. If they don't tell you not to 360, you're asked to look at the general case, and that's a one that would look at a whole load of revolutions, which will be the n360, or it'll be n by 2 pi. So I can say cos of r is equal to a half. That implies r is 60 degrees. Now, knowing where they are here, I can say that 3 theta So, 120, and we'll just show you where we got that. And 240s. Now, if we haven't been told that our theta, um, that you can get theta rotations here, what we've got to do now is we've got to say plus n360. Okay? Now, what does that tell us? We can now say that implies theta is equal to Even, even for one single rotation, not even counting a whole load of extra ones, we will find several answers to this particular problem. And how we do it is we start off with our n equals 0. And when n is 0, we can say theta is equal to 40 or theta is equal to 80. When n is equal to 1, theta is going to be 40 plus that, which is equal to 160. Or it's 80 plus 
the 120 which is 200 now if we went beyond the n equal to 2 you will now be repeating you'll be going around on extra loops here so even in taking this from 0 to 360 we find all of these answers and we could go around loop after loop after loop which is the general solution one so we could actually if we wanted to go around loop after loop we could be saying 80 plus n 360s what makes this different to previous things uh, for example just the general polar coordinates that you've got in complex numbers and the turn up in a number of other places is that we actually have to bring this n360 in even for one loop in other words not even getting beyond the 360 degrees and the reason we had to do it is because that thing said 3 theta it said more than a single theta if it was a simple single theta like the sine theta equal to minus a half the last time you could see immediately from your graph then that um, you had two solutions to that you graph them you found the two solutions when we have three theta you can call this in your mind you can call it an angle a and now we're looking at our angle a over here you'd say it's one or the other of these two solutions so this a angle will be equal to this or that but we know a is 3 theta so we've got to go 0, 1, 2 in order to find the answers for ourselves here because we've got our 3 theta they're the easiest trigonometric equations because they're fundamentally a trigonometric function and you're looking for the angles that solve those they do get a little bit more complicated for example again an example in the book So why would x not be equal to 45 or 225? Well, we know that the angle 45 is unusual because it's, it, it is um, its own alternative because in this normal situation where we have an angle A, this one is 90 minus A. And we could normally say, as we saw the last time, that cos A was equal to sine of The interesting thing is that 45 will occupy both sides, and that is why cos 45 is equal to sine 45. And under that circumstance, what we'll get here, if it was 45 degrees or 225 degrees, you would get equal to 1 over 0, and that's not allowed. So we're just getting rid of the pain of a problematic solution by specifying it can't be those. We're not allowing those answers. Well, what else do you notice? a theme you should start to recognize in your leaving certain maths is that we are trained through the leaving certain maths course to look and observe naming things is a big thing like this is just a something you can call it anything you like we will just say for the moment in our mind we'll call it a we can call this anything we'll call that b say aha that is a isn't it and that is b now when we look at it that way we've got a plus b 
equal to 1 over a minus b. And if you never recognize anything else in your leaving cert course, you must recognize that we are now facing the factors for the difference of two squares. So I know if I multiply across by a minus b, I'll have a plus b by a minus b. And we're saying it's equal to 1 here. And you'd say that's a squared minus b squared. OK? So then, let's have a look. We now know and can identify this. And it doesn't take mathematics to identify it. That's simply, if you're familiar with it, you know that that is simply the identity for sorry, I should be writing x's here so we're saying cos squared x minus sine squared x equals 1 we're saying, aha, I can substitute in from an identity and I get this as an answer and now we're at the exact same little game again. We draw our drawing. <coughs> so where do we get 1 as an answer? It appears here. So then. So we're saying 2x is naught plus n360. So obviously we're saying hmm, it'll occur here when you have no angle. It'll also occur as the angle winds around. So we're saying 2x is naught plus n360. x is equal to 180n. So we're saying that implies when n is equal to 0, x is equal to 0 n equals 1, x is equal to 180. Why have we got the 360 in here? Because surely 360 degrees is the same as 0 degrees. It brings you right back onto this little dot point again. The reason for it has to do with this. Remember I mentioned to you, watch very, very carefully. In a previous example, we had it as naught less than or equal to the angle less than 360, so we didn't need to include the final solution. In this one, it has less than or equal, naught less than or equal to zero, less than or equal to 360. So we have to look at the 360 case. So even though technically that's the same as that, they must both be shown because we've been asked to show it up here. This thing, this thing means that I must show this and I must show that. Now fundamentally there isn't a lot of stuff that needs to be talked about on the rest of the chapter. Inverse functions, there's several pages on them, but they're actually quite easy. What they will say to you is something like a is equal to the inverse sine of minus root 3 over 2. What does that mean? a is the inverse sine. That means a is the angle whose sine is minus root 3 over 2. So we could say now what 
we'll need is to find the R angle, the reference angle, which is root 3 over 2. <coughs> and finding that, what we will get is that a, there is a drawing, as we always draw them, and we're saying, oh, if that's the case, that implies R is equal to, if the sine of R is root 3 over 2, R is 60. So we're going 60 degrees. It's a negative. See? It's down in the negative side here, okay? That's because of this guy here. Now, in reality, we also have this one over here. But do we use that? And this is the point I wish to make in relation to this. For the causes, we're going to go and we will look at half of the circle. And for the signs, we look at half of the circle. For causes, and this is the bit you watch for, we're saying I'm going to go from positives right across to the negative. For the signs, you'll be looking at these down to here. Okay? That's all the plus ones here and the negative ones here. The causes, these ones. So even though we had this other solution over here, we don't look at it for these particular things. So we can say that implies A equals minus 60 degrees because we're only using the right-hand side of the unit circle. Other than that, things just come down to populating up the triangle. If we're looking at any sort of a triangle and we'll say A equals the angle whose sine is x, you'll say, hmm, how could that be? If that's A, and we'd say sine, that's the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the hypotenuse must be 1. And we'd say, what does that mean about this side here? It's 1 minus x squared. So I can immediately now tell you, okay, first off, easy. The only last thing, and I'll only spend a few seconds on it, has to do with the trigonometric limit. It's the limit as the angle approaches zero. Sine theta over theta is equal to one. Or you can state it the other ways around, because 1 over 1 is 1. We can say the limit as theta, the angle, approaches 0 of theta over sine theta is equal to 1. How do we use it? We use it to try and get limits of other trigonometric functions. For example... Well, it's unfortunate that we don't have a 3 down here, because then I'd have sine 3x over 3x. So I could multiply top and bottom by 3, which is what I will do. And that will give me what I need. And now I've got 3x down here, but because I put in this 3 down here, I must multiply by 3 up top. So that's equal to 3 by the limit as x goes to 0 of sine 3x over 3x. And we know that that is 1. So the answer 
is 3. Naturally, if we get something which has got cosses in it, for example, if we had the limit what we want to do is we want to convert any trigonometric function that we have into signs okay so then and we should recognize that we can make a substitution Now, having made the substitution, and all we're left with are signs, we want to divvy out what we have up top and down underneath. So that's equal to I know it's a bit crushed at the inside here, but I'm running out of space and I don't want to have to go onto a new screen and to have all this stuff lost. So we can say what we need Is that as an answer? They are straightforward. It's very important, though, to play with these limits. Limits come up in series and sequences. They come up in calculus, and in particular, they come up in the special question. You must get familiar with these things. They're straightforward. The rules relating to them are straightforward. They are a great opportunity to master something that gets applied into several sections. So, all I would say to you is that instead of thinking that we are looking at a real uh, problem area, which is trigonometry, what I would hope you'd get from this, because I'm trying not to dig deep into this, I would hope you'd recognize that instead of complicated, what you're looking at is a section with a lot of little equations. None of them are complicated. There's just a lot of them. Now, fortunately, the new um, log tables give you the a much better um, rundown of these equations than the old log tables because the new ones have the cos of A plus B equal to, and they also have the cos of A minus B. Prior to this, you had a certain amount of deducing to do in relation to signs. That's all gone now. They're in the book. But if you wish to speed up and save yourself time in the Leaving Cert, you should get very good at these because you need to be in a position where you can look at something and say, OK, I know how to convert that into something else that will be useful. For example, in that case here, how to change that into that. We can become masters at doing that. And the new good news then is, if you do that, this is a section that will reward you with a lot of marks. It takes some effort, but what you learn in trigonometry here makes it much easier when you're dealing with calculus, particularly integral calculus, and also your special question, and the last part of complex numbers. Okay?
the next one will be the second one, the second half of complex numbers. So I'll see you then. Bye now.